Pretty blue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I think this is better. Do I look better now? Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Kita <laughs> mulai ya. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank to uh, Dr. Rasmi who taken this time so early in the morning to give a lecture to student and lecture from UB and also thank for all students for joining in our discussion today. Uh, the theme for lecture was about our state. It is a continuation of yesterday lecture which discusses about the basics of international law of the sea. Uh, now I would like to invite uh, Dr. Hasmi to give a presentation. Uh, Dr. Hasmi, time is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, <clears throat> Yasniar. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the uh, brief introduction. Okay, let me begin with my presentation now. Just give me a while to share my screen. Okay, I hope everyone can see my screen here. Sure. All right. Okay. Uh, I, I just need one information. Uh, the students joining this morning, are they the, the same batch as yesterday or a new batch? Yeah, most uh, new batch and most of them is in uh, attending yesterday lecture. Ah, okay, okay. So I will just brief, I will just briefly introduce myself very quickly. Uh, and okay, right. Uh, my name, uh, dear students, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi taala wabarakatuh, uh, and friends from University Brawijaya, Dr. Diana, Patricia, uh, Audrey, Bu Yasnia, Siska, uh, Ula, if you are here, uh, and everyone, thank you very much. Uh, this has been uh, um, uh, the second time I've been invited as a visit as a visiting professor here, and it. It has always been a pleasure. Saya sangat bersenang hati berada di sini. But lebih senang hati kalau berada di Brawijaya. But insyaAllah that will be uh, something that will happen in the future after the, the pandemic ends. Okay, um, uh, my name is Hazmi. Uh, for the students who have joined today, my name is Hazmi. Uh, I'm, yeah, I'm from Malaysia, but my ancestors are from Sumatera Barat. So uh, in a way, I still have some Indonesian blood in me. And um, I obtained my PhD from Australian National Center for Ocean Resources and Security, University of Wollongong, Australia. So both me and Dr. Diana, we are, we are Australian alumnus. Uh, and uh, Dr. Diana was in Queensland while I was in, um, in Wollongong. Uh, so the weather in New South Wales in Wollongong is much, much um, colder than what uh, Dr. Diana has to endure in Queensland. And uh, I, I have been teaching as an, as an associate professor at the Faculty of Sharia and Law for more than 10 years. Uh, and I also have been teaching in a number of universities all around the world. And this is where I obtained my PhD at the University of uh, Wollongong, not too far away from Sydney. And this is the photo of my uh, Wisuda. Uh, and tomorrow I will be attending Wisuda in Usim. Luckily, the government allowed us to have a face-to-face -face wisuda after all the students got really angry on social media. So just to say to you, social media is very powerful. If the students got angry and uh, mereka mengamuk di social media, uh, the ministry would allow a face-to-face -face, uh, wisuda with, uh, with proper SOPs, right? Uh, and... Uh, this is my photo when I was teaching in Russia. I was supposed to go there again last year, but COVID-19 has put everything on, uh, to a halt. This is me at the building, at the rectory building of the Far Eastern Federal University. And uh, I also teach in other universities in East Timor. This was my student. Um, and um, this is Rumah Adat in, in Timor Leste. And uh, among the newspaper cuttings about me in Malaysia, in Malay language and also in English. So I've been doing this for quite some time and inshallah, I will try to share uh, my um, what I have with uh, the, the, the modest uh, knowledge that I have and also some experience in this field with everyone. 
And today we are going to talk about archipelagic state because it's very relevant. Uh, and uh, it's very relevant because Indonesia is actually an archipelagic state. And yesterday I, I lectured a little bit on baseline and today we are going to go deeper on it. Um, yeah, I'm also, uh, just to share with everyone, I also have been, have been uh, appointed as an honorary lieutenant commander with the Royal Malaysian Navy Reserve Team. Uh, tapi saya ini uh, tentara yang bukan pergi berperang, tapi tentara yang menulis, uh, itu bedanya. Menulis terkait soal hukum laut. And um, before we uh, before we move forward to archipelagic state, I just want to share with everyone. This is an old data. I ha also have a new data. I just want to share with you. These are among the most important sea lines of communications in the world. Um, Straits of Malacca and Singapore is there, and Suez Canal is also there. I suppose. Oh, oh yes, yeah, Suez Canal. Remember. When one ship got stuck in Suez Canal, what happened to the whole world? The whole world went haywire because uh, when um, when a normal high maritime highway is being blocked, then alternative route has to be used. And when alternative routes are used, this would cause billions of dollars of uh, losses in terms of shipping costs. Uh, that's why, like like uh, when you are traveling from Jakarta to, let's say, uh, you are traveling from Jakarta to uh, uh, Bandung, for example. If the highway got stuck, if the highway connecting Jakarta and Bandung got stuck, you have to use other alternative route, will, will, will take longer. And when the route is longer, you will consume more petrol. So it's just the same analogy. And this is the, uh, the recent um, data. You can see that the one of the most important sea lines of communication is the Strait of Malacca. One have to remember if something happened to Strait of Malacca, the alternative route is via Sunda, Strait of Sunda, Lombo and Makassar. That is the nearest alternative route applicable uh, to shipping industries, to mariners, if one way or another Strait of Malacca got blocked. Uh, this is to say to you that the Indonesian archipelagic straits are really important for navigation. If not for, if not as a main maritime conduits, but at least as an alternative, right? So um, this is what I'm talking about. At the moment, uh, ships sailing from west to east, they will just uh, traverse through the Indian Ocean, going down the Straits of Malacca and all the way up to the far eastern ports of Yokohama, of Busan, or any ports in China. Just imagine if the Strait of Malacca or Sunda, Lombok Makassar, is no, are no longer available, then ships have to go around Australia up, uh, uh, and going up the Pacific Ocean towards East Asia. So this is... Uh, remarkably, uh, in, this this is a remarkable increase in navigational distance, uh, double the navigational distance using the normal Malacca Straits route. All right. So, one thing for sure: Indonesian archipelagic strait, Sunda, Lombok, and Makassar are important in maritime uh, for maritime navigation. If not as a main maritime route, at least as alternatives to the Strait of Malacca. So how do we establish an archipelago? Because we are talking about archipelagic strait. So how do we establish archipelagic state? Uh, number one, we have we, in order to establish maritime zones of jurisdiction, like what I have lectured yesterday, uh, baseline is important. Uh, uh, baseline in Bahasa Indonesia is uh, garis pangkal. Uh, garis pangkal. And it is fundamental to maritime claims because number one, we define outer limits of internal waters, starting point for maritime uh, claiming maritime zones, and provide base point for generation of limits of national maritime claims. There are three types of baseline: normal baseline, straight baseline, and archipelagic baseline. Okay, I will discuss archipelagic baseline in a while, in a bit. But now I would like to focus on normal and straight first. Okay, I think I have discussed what normal baseline is. Normal baseline according to Article uh, 5. Okay, Article 5 of the Law of the Sea Convention. The normal baseline for measuring the breadth of the territorial sea is the low water line along the coast. 
So apabila kalian ke pantai dan lihat paras air surut, uh, that is the normal baseline. It's as simple as that. That is how you determine normal baseline. But in in certain countries, there are agencies to do this. For Malaysia, we have Jabatan Ukur dan Pemetaan, Mapping Department of Malaysia. And most probably in Indonesia, you have your own mapping agency, right? And um, and this is normal baseline. So normal baseline is measured from the low water line uh, at the beach. Okay. Sometimes states can resort to to use straight baseline. Straight baseline, as mentioned in Article Seven, it uh, it says that in localities where the coastline is deeply indented and cut into, or where there is a fringe of island along the coast in its immediate vicinity, the method of straight baseline joining appropriate points may be employed to draw baseline. Okay, I know it's a little bit confusing with all these long and difficult words. Let me put this into animation. So, if the coast is straight like that, um, for example, if you go to um, uh, in Indonesia, uh, most probably areas with a uh, straight coastline are in Bali. Uh, but bear in mind, Indonesia does not apply normal baseline. Indonesia applies archipelagic baseline. I just want you to imagine a long coast. In Malaysia, uh, we have straight long coast in the state of Trengganu, in eastern coast of Peninsula Malaysia facing South China Sea. Most probably in Indonesia, you have straight long coast in uh, in Padang, in Sumatra, in Bengkulu, uh, because they really have straight coast. Okay, in those areas, most probably states would employ normal baseline, i.e. looking at the low water line and use it as a normal base, uh, as a baseline to measure territorial sea and other maritime zones of jurisdiction and maritime entitlements of the coastal state. However, if the coast looks like this, deeply cut, fringing and has outlying islands, it is difficult to use normal baseline because if you use normal baseline, you will create a mosaic baseline, something like that. And this would cause difficulties for the coastal state to, 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 to exert their jurisdiction over the coast over their maritime areas. So instead of using normal baseline in this locality, international law has devised another innovative rule whereby straight baseline can be used to connect out, outlying islands like that. And this would be the baseline connecting the outermost point of the outermost coast to the islands located adjacent to it. Okay, where can you find this kind of coastline? <clears throat> you can find this kind of coastline in Scandinavian countries, for example, in Norway, in Sweden, and in Finland. And another example is in Scotland, United Kingdom, where they have coastline that looks like this. So how do you really measure baseline if your coastline looks like that? Normal baseline will not make any sense because it will create a mosaic baseline and mosaic shaped territorial sea, making enforcement difficult. But in straight coastline like this, this is Coffs Harbour in Australia. It's more suitable to, have, to, to, me, to measure uh, territorial sea using normal baseline. So that's the difference between normal <coughs> and straight baseline. Now, the third thing I would like to discuss with everyone here is archipelagic baseline, where Indonesia is one of the countries in the world that has applied this. <coughs> According to Article 46 of the LOSC or the Law of the Sea Convention, an archipelagic state is one constituted wholly of one or more archipelagos, but may also include other islands. Jadi, menurut LOSC, negara, ke, negara, negara kepulauan adalah negara kepulauan apabila ia dibentuk oleh banyak pulau. When it is being, uh, uh, it constituted a lot of islands. <coughs> so, in our minds, we would be thinking of United Kingdom. United Kingdom has a lot of islands. Yet, uh, United Kingdom is not located in continental Europe, but it's an island. Iceland may be also a candidate a, a candidate. I'm not saying it's an archipelagic country. It can be a candidate. Japan, Indonesia, Philippines, and all those countries. 
island countries. Eh? So uh, this is according to Article 46. But we have to go further to Article 47. Right, an archipelagic state may draw straight baseline joining the outermost point of the outermost island and drying reefs of the archipelago Okay, provided that such baseline are included in the main islands and an area in which the ratio of the area of the water to the area of land is between 1 to 1 and 9 to 1. So, archipelagic baseline can only be drawn to connect the outermost point of the outermost island and drying reefs within the archipelago. And when such line has been drawn, okay, the nation, the archipelagic nation, must have a ratio of water to land one water to one land up to nine water to one land in terms of ratio in terms of ratio and the archipelagic baseline shall not exceed 100 nautical miles except up to three percent of the total number of baseline enclosing the archipelago may exceed that length up to a maximum length of 125 nautical miles meaning in that archipelago each island cannot be located more than 100 nautical miles away from each other. Not only the ratio of water to land, water must be more than land or water must be similar to land in terms of ratio, but the distance between one island to the other must not be more than 100 nautical miles, except 3% can extend up to 125 nautical miles. Okay, so these are all the five conditions that have to be met but I would like to focus on B and C. All right, B and C, uh, B and D, okay? B, uh, sorry, B and, uh, yeah, B and uh, C. Okay, must not, this is 100, 100 not, so it's not 125, it's 100 uh, nautical miles, right? So when this happens, what would happen to all countries that I've mentioned earlier, like Japan, like the UK, Okay, so these requirements deter certain states to claim archipelagic status as the United Kingdom and Japan has more land than water. If let's say they draw the outermost point of the island uh, to the outermost point of the island here, joining Isle of Man, going back to Ireland, if you draw all the lines uh, uh, around United Kingdom, you can see that the water is less than land. So therefore, even though United Kingdom Kingdom, even though United Kingdom is a country which is uh, formed by island, but it is not an archipelagic state under the Law of the Sea Convention. The same goes with Japan. If you draw archipelagic baseline connecting all the outermost island, okay, around it, Japan will have more land than water. So obviously, they will fail in uh, attaining archipelagic status. Okay. There is also an example where a nation would fail to become an archipelagic state because they have more water than land. An example is Kiribati. Uh, it's located over there. I'm pretty sure you can see it. Let me bring you closer to Kiribati. This is one of the islands of Kiribati. But Kiribati is, ba is basically all these territories. So just imagine if you, according to the law of the Sea Convention, Article 47, the extent of baseline, the extent of, uh, um, uh, of the baseline must not exceed 100 nautical miles from each other. I'm pretty sure from this outermost island in Gilbert Islands towards Phoenix Island, the distance is much, much more than 100 nautical miles. And even if you draw baseline enclosing all the small islands located, located within Kiribati, you would notice that the ratio of water is more than land it will be obviously more than nine this would be like 1000 to one or more than a thousand but in uh, uh, as far as japan and north united kingdom is concerned the land might be 12 and the water just three something like that okay uh, and indonesia is one of the countries in the world that uh, that has been recognized as archipelagic state and um, even though i'm malaysian i am very proud that Indonesia is, is, is the country that has fought tirelessly to ensure that the world community acknowledge the status of archipelagic state. Uh, this was done to protect the Tanah and Ai of Indonesia. Uh, and because we say if we read books, usually we will learn that international law is developed by was developed by Europeans, but archipelagic 
uh, concept was developed by Indonesia. And this is something that we can, we can all be proud of. And <clears throat> Indonesia has declared itself as an archipelago uh, state in 1960 through law number no. four, 1960. And uh, when Indonesia declared itself as an archipelago state, it has provoked international protests, right? So what happened next? This archipelago state was discussed in the United Nations Conference on the Law of the Sea. Uh, and after much compromise, it has been included as part four of in the Law of the Sea Convention. As you can see, Indonesia is formed by lots and lots of islands, and it managed to become an archipelago state because it fulfills the requirement of Articles 46 and 47, whereby the baseline connecting all the islands are located within 100 nautical miles limit. And when all these lines were drawn, connecting all the islands located within the archipelago, the ratio of water to land fits the requirement mentioned in Article 47. As you can see, IA in Indonesia is more than land. All right. So it can be one to one up to nine to one. As long as the ratio water to land is similar or water is more than land, for uh, archipelagic state can claim itself as archipelagic state as mentioned in Law of the Sea Convention. Other examples of archipelagic state is in the Philippines, where when they draw baseline, okay, uh, enclosing all the islands within the archipelago, the ratio of water to land fits the, uh, what has been prescribed in Article 47. Another example is Fiji, right? <clears throat> so why, does, why did Indonesia fought for the concept of archipelagic state? It is because, because in Malaysia, when we say, when we refer to negara, we will say tanah air. Uh, because if you attended my lecture a couple of uh, days ago or yesterday's lecture, I have also uh, uh, give a lecture on the history of maritime civilization of the people of the Nusantara, whereby our, all our past kingdoms were basically telesocratic teles kingdoms, meaning that all the kingdoms were, were created it was formed because of the sea. So the people of the Nusantara, the people of the Malay archipelago cannot run away from the fact that we are all sea people. And therefore, tanah and air tidak boleh dipisahkan. We are one. Tanah and air is the same. That's why when we refer to our country, regardless if you're Malaysian or Indonesian, we will say, aku akan pulang ke tanah air ku tak lama lagi. Tanah air. Why? Because tanah and air play important role in the formation of countries like Indonesia. Right. Just imagine if there is no archipelagic, uh, archipelagic concept and Indonesia's uh, uh, baseline is being drawn uh, 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 on, in, on each and every individual island. Obviously, high seas and EZ corridor will um, occur within the archipelago. When this happens, any vessels can come, any foreign vessels can come into waters within Indonesia and, for example, have military exercises there because this is, in fact, EEZ. This is an EEZ, like what has been done by US and Australia in South China Sea. They are doing for not freedom of navigation operations. I'm pretty sure Indonesia doesn't want that to happen in waters within its archipelago. That's why, in order to safeguard Indonesia's uh, water and Indonesia's islands, Indonesia came up with archipelagic state, okay? All right, and have drawn, have drawn baseline connecting all, all the outlying islands in order to transform the water within this archipelagic baseline, okay, to become archipelagic waters. So when this is done, Indonesia became an archipelagic state transforming the uh, water within the baseline to become archipelagic waters, Indonesia's security and rights are more preserved and protected. So what is the effect of transforming the waters within this baseline as archipelagic waters? Number one, in terms of navigation of foreign vessels. <coughs> navigation of foreign vessels. Okay, um, how does foreign ship sail through Indonesia's archipelagic waters? Okay, if it, uh, one method is through innocent passage, innocent passage, but as I have been, I, I have explained yesterday, foreign vessels, if they exercise innocent passage to traverse to territorial sea or archipelagic waters, their 
their rights, their innocence. Once their innocence uh, is gone, the passage of such vessels can be suspended under Article 25, Clause 3 of the Law of the Sea Convention. Meaning that <coughs> foreign vessels, when they sail through Indonesia's archipelagic waters, if they are no longer innocent, okay, their passage can be suspended under Article 25, Clause 3. All right. So when this happens, many maritime states were not happy because they want to have free passages all over the world. As a result, archipelagic sea lanes passage was introduced as part four of, uh, in the part four law of the sea convention, allowing foreign vessels to navigate freely through archipelagic sea lanes. Nevertheless, if the vessel ceased to navigate within the ESLs, the regime of innocent passage would apply. Okay, and could, as I mentioned earlier, under Article 25, Clause 3, could be temporarily suspended. Okay, so what is archipelagic sea lanes passage? Okay, an archipelagic state, according to Article 53, may designate sea lanes and air routes suitable for continuous and expeditious passage of foreign ships and aircraft through or over its archipelagic waters. Okay, and according to Article 50, uh, according to Article 53, Clause 3, okay, archipelagic sea lanes passage refers to continuous, expeditious, and unobstructed transit. In a, it, meaning that, in comparison to innocent passage, the right of archipelagic sea lanes passage cannot be obstructed by any archipelagic state. And an archipelagic state may designate sea lanes within its archipelago, all right? And uh, the, the, the archipelagic sea lanes, uh, ships, if they want to, foreign ships, if they want to sail freely without any obstruction within Indonesian archipelagic state, okay, must stay within the line and cannot deviate more than 25 nautical miles to either side on such axis lines. Once they deviate, archipelagic sea lanes passage will no longer take place, innocent passage will replace it. Remember, if innocent passage applies, the passage of foreign vessels could be temporarily suspended if it is no longer innocent, as mentioned in Article 25, Clause 3. <clears throat> okay, so um, this is the law applicable in Indonesia with regards to archipelagic sea lanes passage. Peraturan Pemerintah Nomor 37 Tahun 2002, Peraturan Pemerintah Nomor 36 Tahun 2002. So, let me show you where archipelagic sea lanes passage, archipelagic sea lanes are have been designated in Indonesia. Number one is Sunda. Number two is Lombok Makassar. Number three is Ombai Weta. So, ships, foreign ships, if they enter Indonesian archipelagic waters, they can enter Indonesian archipelagic waters without prior permission because they can exercise the right of innocent passage while sailing through Indonesian archipelagic waters. However, as I mentioned a lot of times, the application of uh, innocent passage may be temporarily suspended. So if maritime states do not want their passage to be suspended, they have to remain within these lines that have been approved by the Indonesian government if they want to sail without obstruction through Indonesian archipelagic, uh, Indonesian waters, Indonesian archipelagic waters. So this is the first Alur Laut Kepulauan Indonesia. This is the second Alur Laut Kepulauan Indonesia. And this is the third Alur Laut Kepulauan Indonesia. Question arises, what, let's say if an American ship, they, they do not want to sail through Sunda, Lombok, Makassar, but, uh, but uh, Lombok Makassar and Ombai Weta, but instead they want to sail from here all the way to here without obstruction. Can they do that? Okay, if you look at Article 53, Class 12, what happens if the archipelagic state does not designate sea, route, sea lanes or air routes? Article 53, Class 12 mentions that the right of archipelagic sea lanes passage may be exercised through routes normally used for international navigation. Meaning that even though Indonesia have not designated east-west route, Indonesia had only designated archipelagic sea lanes route north-south. See, Sunda is south and going to north. Lombok Makassar is also north and south. 
Ombai Weta is also north and south. What if <coughs> for a foreign vessel wants to sail west to east? According to Article 53, Clause 12, okay, they can still exercise archipelagic sea lanes passage, even though Indonesia has not done so, as long as it is a normal uh, route used for international navigation. So who does who who prescribe this? Most probably International Maritime Organization or International Hydrographic Organization. But one thing for sure, all right, uh, in order for states, foreign vessels to uh, sail freely without obstruction through archipelagic waters of Indonesia is that they have to remain within this archipelagic sea lanes passage. If they deviate 25 nautical miles to the left or 25 nautical miles to the right, archipelagic sea lanes passage will no longer be applicable. It will be replaced by innocent passage that can be obstructed. Okay, innocent passage can be obstructed, can be suspended under, under Article 25 plus 3. Right. So right now, these are the three most important navigational routes uh, through Indonesian archipelagic waters. And, my, uh, and I would like to also share with all of you, Indonesia is the only country that has designated archipelagic sea lanes within its archipelagic waters. Philippines have not done so, but Indonesia has. Uh, but the US and other maritime states have requested Indonesia to designate west and east route. Uh, and I do not know if Indonesia would want to do that. And um, this is Sunda Strait, uh, which is important for, uh, uh, for navigation, uh, for uh, international navigation as well. Right. And there were plans for Indonesian government to build the bridge uh, connecting uh, Sumatra and Java, but this has been called off by the Jokowi government because President Jokowi wanted to introduce uh, Tol Laut, okay, uh, to turn Indonesia into a maritime state. And uh, Lombok Makassar is located between Bali, uh, Strait of Lombok is located between Bali and Lombok and Makassar between Borneo and Makassar. Uh, it is deep, this waterway is deep and, uh, and not many navigation hazards, but sailing through Lombok and Makassar takes longer time. And just imagine if this, all these streets are closed for international navigation, like I said earlier, ships have to go around Australia. That's why managing navigational routes is important. And the final one is Ombai Weta. But Ombai Weta is not really a preferred route as an alternative because it is located too far away from the main navigational highway, main maritime highway. Okay, so in conclusion, Archipelagic Sea Lands Passage is an Indonesian innovation, something that Indonesians have to be proud of because Indonesia is the one created who created this, uh, this concept under Pak Hashim Jalal. And ASLP is an Indonesian innovation which has realized when UNCLOS was finally formalized in 1982, uh, a law of the sea convention. The ASL, ASLP, Archipelagic, Archipelagic Sea Lands Passage, is a quid pro quo for uh, what you give one thing in return to the other. For maritime states, they have agreed to the formation of Archipelagic State. The only reason why Indonesia managed to become Archipelagic State because Indonesia allows Indonesia allows the application of unobstructed Archipelagic Sea Lands Passage through Archipelagic Sea Lands within Indonesian Archipelagic Waters. Okay, the application of ASLP or Archipelagic Sea Lanes Passage is important in ensuring unimpeded right of navigation through archipelagic waters. As far as Indonesian archipelagic waters are concerned, any disruption would um, compromise the well-being of seaborne global trade and the world economy, particularly the Asia Pacific region. Like I said earlier, Indonesian archipelagic waters or Indonesian archipelagic Strait of Sunda, Lombok, and Makassar are important alternatives to the Strait of Malacca and Singapore. And it's important to ensure that all these routes are open for navigation. And Indonesia has been very cooperative since independence. So with that, I end my talk today. I know it's a little bit technical, this topic, but if you have any questions, I would be very happy to address them. Thank you very much. And I'm passing the floor back to Ibu Yasnia. Thank you, Dr. Hasmi. It's an delightful lecturer. Now, um... Uh, this lecture is talk about the archipelagic concept, including archipelagic baseline, navigation, rules, also uh, trade and challenge uh, as an archipelagic state. Teman-teman uh, mahasiswa, ini kan sebetulnya adalah uh, hal yang sangat penting untuk Indonesia. Kebetulan juga Indonesia itu sebagai negara ke kepulauan yang punya andil juga di dalam uh, aturan tentang 
negara kepulauan. Jadi teman-teman sekarang saya harapkan bisa mungkin sharing, bertanya, dan juga bisa mungkin memberikan komentar. Bisa juga terkait tidak hanya terhadap konsepnya, tetapi juga terhadap kasus-kasus yang terjadi kaitannya dengan navigation di archipelagic uh, state. Seperti itu. Saya persilahkan. Bisa langsung dituliskan di chat box atau disampaikan secara langsung. Terima kasih. Ayo silakan. Sepertinya banyak yang belum bangun ya. Halo. Atau Bu Diana bisa menambahkan dulu Bu, biar teman-teman agak semangat dipancing dulu Bu. Menambahkan apa ya? Uh, mungkin dari dari sudah. Saya rasa kuliahnya Hasmi sudah komplit dan apa sangat mudah dipahami ya untuk kelompok eh kelas A. Saya rasa penjelasan saya yang sudah saya berikan di negara kepulauan memang hampir mirip atau ya sudah tercover semua dengan Hasmi. Mungkin we have we have incident Hasmi on. To 2003, when the USS Carl Vinson passed through the East and West uh, Sea Lands, uh, and there is a mis misinterpretation between Indonesia and uh, USA. That time, that USA referred to Article 53, uh, Paragraph 4, and 12. That They did not um, violate the right of archipelagic sea land passage, while Indonesian authorities said it was violate the archipelagic sea land passage, right? Uh, according to national law. So maybe you can uh, ask, ask me, what if uh, there is a conflict between national law and international law in that case, uh, which law will prevail? Ya, jadi kalau ada ketika tidak sesuai antara hukum nasional Indonesia yang mengatakan bahwa hanya hanya tiga alki aja lewat, tetapi dia Amerika tidak lewat tiga alki tapi lewat Timur Barat sesuai dengan pasal 53 ayat 4 dan 53 ayat 12. Maybe you can, <coughs> yeah, you can explain to them. Hmm. Terima kasih Bu Diana. It's a, uh, it's a very interesting uh, question and it's a very interesting um, case review on this matter. All right, uh, so if there is a conflict, okay, uh, if there is a conflict, then um, we are talking about the United States here. We are talking about the United States and the United States have been doing phonops all over the world, including South China Sea. And <clears throat> uh, my opinion is, um, there is, uh, first things first, the US is not member state of the Law of the Sea Convention. Okay, the US is not a state, uh, a, a party, state party to the Law of the Sea Convention. And whether or not um, archipelagic, uh, the concept of archipelagic waters is customary international law can also is also questionable. Okay, even though United States, even though United States. It's not a state party to the law of the sea convention, but United States regard almost all provisions in the law of the sea convention as uh, customary international law. Uh, for example, innocent passage, for example, uh, the right of uh, uh, um, freedom of navigation, fisheries rights, and all those things. Now, question arises. Um, archipelagic waters is actually... <clears throat> The concept of archipelagic waters is actually a creation of United Nations Conference on the Law of the Sea. So question number one, is the concept of archipelagic waters, is the concept of archipelagic waters have been recognized as customary international law? So if it has not been recognized, by, uh, recognized as customary international law, can the US exercise archipelagic sea lanes passage? Because if it has not been recognized as customary international law, because US is not a state party to the Law of the Sea Convention, until and unless the archipelagic waters have been recognized as customary international law, 
then technically, as a non-state member of, of Law of the Sea Convention, US cannot exercise such right. But obviously, US would argue in a way that it has been 40 years since, uh, uh, I mean, almost 40 years uh, since the Law of the Sea Convention came into force, or Law of the Sea Convention was created back in 1982. So within the 40 years time limit, obviously, archipelagic waters may have been elevated to the <clears throat> to the status of customary international law. Okay, that's number one. <clears throat> and number two, um, it has been stated clearly in the convention, in the convention, according to Article 53, Clause 12, Article 53, Clause 12, that if an archipelagic state has yet to designate archipelagic sea lanes, for example, like Philippines have not done that, Indonesia have not done that for the east-west uh, route. So the uh, foreign vessels may exercise ASLP, ASLP um, within the non uh, within uh, the archipelagic waters that have not been designated as such, as long as that particular maritime area have been used for navigation for a long time. And usually this is recognized by I, uh, the, the maritime route is recognized either by IMO or I, IHO. Uh, so when there is a conflict between Indonesian law that, that only designate three Alkis and suddenly US wanted to use East-West lanes, I think, um, don't get me wrong, uh, this is just my opinion, I think Indonesia as a state member of the Law of the Sea Convention uh, should acknowledge Article 53, Clause 12. This is my own personal opinion. And in order to make things clear, maybe Indonesia might want to designate East West Lane. Uh, but at the same time, uh, US, if they want to, to, to uh, navigate through the East West Lane that has not been designated as ASLs, they have to respect the sovereignty of Indonesia. They cannot just uh, do whatever they want, even though they, they have they can claim to have exercised the right of unobstructed archipelagic sea lanes passage, but they have to remember that Indonesia is a sovereign state uh, and they are sailing through an area that uh, the world has recognized as part, as part of the territory of Indonesia. This is different with the South China Sea because South China Sea at the moment is being claimed by many countries and Chinese nine dash line claim has not been recognized by any state but only China. But archipelagic waters of Indonesia have been recognized by the whole world as Indonesian maritime territory. So in this regard, if you ask my opinion, I think based on, uh, uh, as Indonesia is a member state of the Law of the Sea Convention, to make things simple, to make things more practical, Indonesia may, might want to consider, might want to consider to designate East West Lane, Number one. And number two, US must also, in return, respect Indonesia as a sovereign state and cannot do as they like. They cannot just do, for example, for not within Indonesian archipelagic waters. Because Indonesian archipelagic waters have been recognized as Indonesia's, uh, within Indonesia's sovereignty. If that's the case, uh, instead of sailing using archipelagic sea lanes passage, uh, uh, US should just exercise innocent passage within areas that have not been designated as archipelagic sea lanes. So I think that's my opinion and my response to Dr. Diana's uh, inquiry. I hope the answer satisfies everyone. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, um, Dr. Hasmi. Um, there is a lot, uh, two questions. The first is from Indra Bangsawan. Bisa disampaikan langsung, Indra? Uh, iya, iya, Bu. Permisi, apakah suara saya terdengar? Ya. Dengar, dengar. Uh, Oke, okay. uh, saya sudah melakukan sedikit riset mengenai isu hukum laut internasional dan menemukan hal yang menarik mengenai apa yang terjadi di Laut Cina Selatan. Uh, bila berkenan, apakah Pak Hasmi bisa menjelaskan apa yang terjadi di sana uh, mengingat terdapat negara Filipina yang juga merupakan negara kepulauan yang memiliki kepentingan di sana. Terima kasih. Jadi uh, apa yang saya mengerti di sini soalan soalan dari Indra soalan dari Indra adalah klaim di Laut Cina Selatan atau gimana? Uh, iya. 
Ha, jadi permasalahan klaim di Laut Cina Selatan. Ya, benar. Adakah, adakah soalan itu uh, uh, ter, 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 terkait soal klaim China? Adakah klaim China itu uh, compatible to international law? Is that your question? Uh, pertanyaan saya lebih ke arah, uh, saya melihat di sana bahwasanya Filipina itu merupakan negara kepulauan dan memiliki klaim wilayah terhadap uh, Laut Cina Selatan. Dan apakah uh, Bapak bisa menjelaskan uh, peraturan atau hukum internasional yang mengatur hal tersebut? Oke, okay, oke, okay, oke. Okay. Thank you very much. Now it's clear. Alright, so um, in South China Sea, uh, you have to remember, kita perlu ingat bahawa Uh, kawasan maritim, uh, maritime area in South China Sea is uh, is not only claimed by Philippines, it's claimed by other states, for example Malaysia, Brunei, uh, Vietnam, uh, China, and Indonesia also claim is that area near Natuna. Okay, so um, all these claims are made based on maritime entitlements of each state as i have been uh, i have i explained yesterday <coughs> coastal states negara negara pantai mempunyai maritime entitlement mempunyai hak untuk claim from its baseline not only territorial sea but they can also claim exclusive economic zone and also continental shelf all right so if a country is located far away from other countries. For example, New Zealand. New Zealand terletak jauh di sudut selatan bumi. Tak terlalu jauh, tapi di sudut selatan bumi. Dan terasing dari negara-negara yang lain. It's located far away from other countries. So, <coughs> when New Zealand okay, claim territorial sea based on its baseline, claim ini tidak akan bertindan dengan claim negara lain. Karena New Zealand, Selandia Baru, terletak jauh dari negara lain. Tetapi di Laut Cina Selatan, the issue is different because South China Sea is encircled by a number of countries that I have mentioned earlier just now. Malaysia, Indonesia, Brunei, Vietnam and the Philippines. So asas claim Filipina terhadap Laut Cina Selatan adalah maritime entitlement Filipina sebagai negara pantai. So because they also have the right to extend their, they also have the right to claim territorial sea, not only territorial sea, exclusive economic zone, and also continental shelf. <coughs> these claims might have overlap with claims of other nations within that region. So asas claim bagi Filipina adalah Negara Filipina adalah negara pantai di Laut Cina Selatan dan uh, apa, United Nations apa namanya itu United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea allows Philippines to make such claims. The only ridiculous claim in South China Sea is made by China. The Nine Dash Line. The Nine Dash Line is not uh, claim is not made based on what has been prescribed by the Law of the Sea Convention because it is historic claims, historic waters. And dalam Law of the Sea Convention, tidak ada laut bersejarah. Yang ada adalah teluk bersejarah, historic base. Ha, jadi, apa yang uh, menurut saya di sini, Filipina boleh claim, tapi sekarang claim Filipina bertindak dengan negara lain. Jadi, terserah kepada negara-negara yang mempunyai claim yang bertindih, yang bertindan to resolve their problems with each other. But in South China Sea, it's a little bit different because there is China there. So, when you are trying to resolve your maritime boundaries, overlapping maritime boundaries with a superpower, problems might, you know, might happen. Uh, like what we are having now in South China Sea. I hope I have answered your question. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, the, the, question, uh, the second question is from Reza. Um, even if an archipelagic has an outer island, it's is only one mile in size and there is only a lighthouse or military base. then it is known that this island interests with the territorial sea of a coastal state um, so how uh, 
to solving this problem both in determining uh, the baseline. Okay. All right. This question is relates to what happened with between Malaysia and Singapore with regards to Pedra Branca. Okay. Um, uh, if you look at the map of Pedra Branca in South China Sea between uh, between Malaysia and Singapore, okay, Pedra Branca is belongs to Singapore and one mile away, less than a kilometer away, our middle rocks belongs to Malaysia. So it's located so close to each other. So how they resolve this matter? Most probably through negotiation. Perbincangan di antara kedua-dua negara to resolve the overlapping maritime boundaries because Singapore from Pedra Branca can claim territorial sea. Sebagai negara pantai, it has maritime entitlement to do that. Malaysia also has maritime entitlement to do that. So for two maritime features, which is located less than a kilometer from each other, obviously there will be overlapping maritime claims. Jadi untuk menjawab soalan yang tadi itu, the only way to 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 um, ensure what is the baseline and where is the maritime boundary between the two countries in this such small area, negotiations is import, uh, it will be done. Uh, for your information, uh, Singapore won uh, Pedra Branca in 2008. 2008, Singapura memenangkan Pedra Branca. Uh, dan Malaysia memenangkan Middle Rocks atau dalam bahasa Melayu kami panggil Batuan Tengah. Uh, that was that happened in 2008. Now it's 2021. Dah berapa tahun dah? It has been a very long time. Negotiation is still taking place. Uh, so what I'm trying to say here is that uh, overlapping maritime territory can be a sensitive issue and sometimes negotiation takes years to finish. So with regards to Pedra Branca example, negotiation is still taking place until now. So we do not know when that will happen. And Indonesia also have maritime entitlement in that area because of the existence of Pulau Bintan. Uh, Indonesia is still waiting for Malaysia to resolve these problems in Pedra Branca, only then Indonesia can join in to end, to draw, to, to claim their maritime areas in that disputed area. Uh, so negotiation is the key. Uh, because if countries cannot negotiate, then problems would happen. And uh, we do not want war between two countries just because of an island or a rock. Okay, I hope I've answered your question. Thank you. Okay, um, the third question uh, is, is there a specific procedure to uh, that must be followed by a country to create an ASLP? Does the country need to the permission uh, permission first to certain in institution or make international agreement first or something? Yeah, I think according to part four of law of the sea convention, maybe Dr. Diana knows more. Uh, <clears throat> I think international agreement is not needed because. It is an internal matter of Indonesia, and Indonesia has the right to establish uh, the archipelagic sea lanes based on the advice of IMO if they want to get advice advice from IMO or IHO. But the procedures, I do not have uh, much knowledge on this. Maybe Ibu Diana may enlighten us on the procedure, but as far as I'm concerned, uh, memerlukan izin atau tidak, uh, uh, memerlukan um, membuat perjanjian internasional, I don't think international law should be made because law of the sea convention itself is an international agreement, multilateral agreement, multilateral treaty. Uh, so it's up to Indonesia to determine which areas within the archipelagic waters to be designated as, designated as ASL uh, based on the advice of, I don't know, maybe IHO or IMO, International Hydrographic Organization or International Maritime Organization. But about the procedure, I do not have much knowledge on that. Uh, maybe Budiana knows more on this. Yeah, maybe I get, thank you, Hatsmia. Maybe I can add to uh, the answer that uh, article you should look at the article 53, uh, paragraph 9. It only said that it should be uh, approved by competent international organization. And competent international organization is still debatable whether it is a United Nations or with this, whether it is uh, another organization. But according, according to Indonesian um, experience, it happens to be the IMO. Like the if the if you're talking about the procedure of uh, determining Indonesian ISLs, uh, it was begin by the uh, 
Indonesian Navy at several meeting, and then we come up come up with three uh, not to salt archipelago sea lands, and then we we had to um, consulted to user maritime state and to IHAO, and then to other user maritime state. And before the IMO approved the Indonesian sea land, actually, uh, when it was consulted with the uh, Indonesian user maritime state, it has been advised by uh, USA, Australia, and uh, United Kingdom that Indonesia should add uh, East West uh, East West Sea lands, but instead Indonesia go ahead with uh, only three North uh, North South Sea lands, and uh, sadly it was approved by the IMO as partial archipelagic sea lands. It is written in the IMO document, so it is questionable whether. Uh, the designation of archipelagic sea lands, which were uh, right, will uh, uh, turn to obligation because the IMO said uh, it is partially, so it, we have to uh, masih punya hutang ya untuk untuk melengkapi to complete the sea lands uh, according to Article 53, Paragraph 12. Ya, jadi jadi untuk prosedurnya secara secara internal kita sudah kita lakukan uh, konvensi hukum laut tidak mengatur prosedurnya bagaimana tetapi di disahkan dengan oleh kompeten organization ya akhirnya AIMO meskipun demikian banyak para ahli hukum laut yang sebenarnya dalam tanda kutip tidak setuju bahwa AIMO itu uh, kompeten organization karena AIMO itu lebih ke safety of navigation gitu ya tidak 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 melihat pada hak dan kewajiban negara tapi dia lebih lihat ke hukum maritimnya tidak ke hukum laut tetapi itulah yang terjadi maybe that's all i can add hasmi thank you very much budiana uh, that's a very interesting insight okay i, I think I, i see yeah. one more final question here on flight information region i'm sorry i do not have Uh, much knowledge on this because this is about flight information region. I know Singapore FIR, FIR is so huge in South China Sea and Malaysian FIR is so small. I do not know much whether Malaysia wants to, to, to take over some of the FIRs. I may have to do some reading on this. I'm sorry who asked this question. Uh, uh, Anis. Uh, I'm sorry, Anis, I can't help you on this. Maybe maybe if uh, I will just go back and read informa uh, some information if I get some info on this, I would obviously share this with you. I'm sorry I cannot help you on this question. Thank you so much. Um, <laughs> uh, Kebetulan ada tamu tadi. A apa tadi ya bahasannya? Ini uh, ada pertanyaan dari mahasiswa. Um, is Malaysia also include in the Singapore FIR, like information region system? Is there is is the answer is the answer is yes. Is there any possibility for Malaysia to overlook it or perhaps take it that is the right term for it? Like Indonesia have been trying to do. Yeah. Ya sebenarnya kalau berbicara tentang fear uh, itu panjang sebenarnya ya. Jadi saya harus menguraikan dari uh, sejarah fear begitu bagaimana kemudian sebagian fear Indonesia itu ada di uh, pengelolaannya itu ada di uh, Singapura dan juga uh, ada di Singapura di sebagian uh, wilayah Kepulauan Rio dan juga Kepulauan Natuna. Nah. Tapi uh, itu bukan bagian dari, jadi kalau kita berbicara fear, itu kita tidak berbicara kedaulatan negara, tapi kita berbicara pelayanan navigasi udara. Jadi kita berbicara keselamatan penerbangan. Seperti itu dulu konsepnya. Nah, uh, kenapa kemudian sebagian wilayah kita masih dikelola fear-nya oleh uh, apa? Singapura itu karena pada waktu pada waktu ada pada, pada waktu ada uh, 
rapat IKO gitu ya soal soal pengelolaan wilayah udara saat itu tahun 1946 Indonesia baru saja merdeka dan Indonesia tidak tidak terlibat di dalam perundingan tersebut seperti itu sehingga dan pada waktu itu wilayah negara Indonesia belum berbentuk negara kepulauan nah, belum berbentuk negara kepulauan nah setelah Uh, permasalahannya adalah ketika kemudian setelah tahun 1982 Indonesia uh, sebagai negara kepulauan. Nah, uh, itu bagian daripada yang awalnya itu bukan bagian dari wilayah kedaulatan negara Indonesia menjadi wilayah kedaulatan negara Indonesia. Nah, kurang lebih uh, kurang lebih uh, seperti itu tahun 1995 itu pernah dilakukan lagi uh, meeting round gitu ya di uh, di IKO soal apa pengelolaan navigasi udara pir di Singapura antara Singapura dengan Indonesia tapi sebenarnya itu secara normatif itu belum belum berlaku karena belum diratifikasi. Nah, sekarang permasalahannya adalah apakah kemudian itu memungkinkan Indonesia untuk mengambil alih. Dan mengambil alih itu bukan mengambil alih kedaulatan ya, tapi mengambil alih pengelolaan wilayah udara di bagian apa yang yang dikelola oleh negara lain. Jadi sebenarnya pengelolaan fir yang dilakukan oleh negara lain itu sudah biasa. Indonesia itu juga mengelola firnya uh, apa Timor Timor Leste gitu ya. Indonesia juga mengelola uh, firnya uh, Christmas Island gitu. Jadi uh, pengelolaan uh, navigasi udara di wilayah negara lain yang dilakukan oleh negara lain itu saya rasa itu itu sudah hal yang biasa. Nah. Kembali lagi ke permasalahan firnya Singapura itu tadi, apakah kemudian itu bisa diambil alih oleh Indonesia? Ya bisa saja. Undang-undang nomor satu dan harusnya, harusnya karena posisi kita ini berbeda dengan beberapa negara yang lain gitu ya, karena kita sebagai negara dengan posisi silang dunia dan itu berada di posisi silang dunia dan itu memberikan posisi strategis buat Indonesia. Nah, sebisa mungkin kita bisa harus mengambil alih itu. Jadi pengambilan alih pengambil alihan ini bukan pengambil alihan kedaulatan tapi pengambil alihan pengelolaan wilayah udara. Jadi pengelolaan pengambil alihan uh, navigasi udara. Jadi kalau kalau di apa? di udara itu kan ada pelayanan navigasi ya jadi air air control service begitu nah itu yang kemudian kita ambil alih istilahnya adalah realignment istilahnya adalah realignment nah uh, undang-undang nomor satu sudah mengamanatkan itu kita harus sampai dengan tahun 2024 gitu ya 2024 sebagian di bawah sampai dengan ketinggian 20 itu sudah kita sudah kita ambil alih gitu tapi di atasnya itu itu kita masih terus proses perundingan sampai dengan Desember 2019 Uh, itu sudah ada beberapa perundingan tapi memang yang menjadi yang menjadi uh, apa ya uh, yang menjadi alot itu ketika kemudian Singapura menggunakan pasal 51 nanti mungkin bisa ditanyakan pada uh, uh, Mr. Hasmin gitu ya uh, pasal 1950 pasal 51 unclos gitu di situ ada recognize perjanjian sebelumnya dan juga uh, traditional fishing fishing right gitu ya nah di wilayah di bagian wilayah yang dikelola oleh fir yang dikelola oleh Singapura itu ada military air ada military training area nya Singapura gitu ya. Nah, itu yang kemudian tentu saja akan menjadi berat. Kenapa kemudian perundingan ini akan apa ya lama dan mungkin juga alot gitu ya. Karena memang kalau kita berbicara apa ruang udara di dalam ruang udara itu ada airways gitu pengelolaan itu juga pengelolaan navigasi itu juga mempunyai nilai ekonomi yang tinggi airways itu juga mempunyai nilai ekonomi yang tinggi gitu ya uh, uh, apa ya kita bayangkan saja pasti tidak akan dengan begitu saja kemudian di, di, diberikan gitu kan dengan berbagai macam apa ya berbagai macam rasionalisasi gitu ya. Nah yang terakhir yang digunakan adalah pasal 51 di mana di situ ada military training area dan Indonesia harus recognize itu gitu. Nah ketika kemudian itu kita ambil alih, tentu saja apa diplomasinya atau perundingannya akan 
ya kalau kita berunding itu kan tidak mungkin rugi salah satu gitu ya dua-duanya harus harus untung gitu kalau kamu dapat apa saya dapat apa gitu ada permintaan kalau memang kalau memang itu pada akhirnya akan diambil alih ya harus ada pengantinya military training area tersebut nah terus itu Desember 2000 ya akhir lah ya mulai Agustus Agustus September Oktober 2019 kemudian 2020 itu uh, pandemi nah ketika pandemi uh, ini memberikan tentu saja memberikan dampak terhadap proses perundingan itu sendiri bahkan ada beberapa beberapa kali sebenarnya juga tetap dilakukan tapi karena memang uh, apa situasi pandemi nah ini kan masing-masing uh, negara juga mengal, me, apa, menerapkan peraturan yang keketatan yang 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 berbeda-beda gitu ya sehingga uh, kemarin sebenarnya saya ingin mengupdate itu di dengan Pak siapa kemarin yang dari Kemenlu uh, tapi sepertinya memang uh, secara umum secara umum uh, itu belum secara efektif perundingan itu belum secara efektif bisa di, diselesaikan atau dilakukan karena memang selain substansinya yang berat gitu ya selain substansinya yang berat juga kondisinya yang saat ini lagi pandemi jadi kurang lebih seperti itu mahasiswa apakah apakah bisa ya tentu saja harus gitu ya menurut saya bukan hanya bisa tapi harus dilakukan demikian Bu Yesnya terima kasih Terima kasih Bu Adi atas penjelasannya. Ini pengetahuan baru untuk kita semua. Um, it's a very interesting discussion, um, but unfortunately uh, we have to end this discussion this morning. Uh, maybe next uh, next time will be a discussion about the law of the sea and the law of the air. And Bu Adi, Bu Diana, and Dr. Rasmi will be the speaker in either maybe an international seminar or through the joint research. Uh, okay, uh, thank you for Dr. Hasmi, uh, for today lecture. Uh, it's very interesting and useful for us. And may you always uh, given, uh, be given that help. Thank you. Thank you, student. The next talk is at, 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 uh, at nine o'clock Indonesian yeah. time, right? Yeah. Okay, so uh, I will leave for a while and then I'll rejoin back in the next 15 minutes. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Bu Yesnia. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Bu Diana. Thank, thank you, Dr. You. Adi. I'll see you later on, okay, in the next 15 minutes. Assalamualaikum. Saya pamitan, thank ya. Thank you, Mr. Hasmi. Salam. Silahkan mahasiswa boleh meninggalkan. Ya, teman-teman mahasiswa bisa meninggalkan ruang ini atau mungkin bisa join lagi nanti di jam 9 karena ada topik yang baru lagi tentang uh, Mari. Ya, Marine, Marine Environmental Law ya, Marine jam, Environmental jam, 9, Law. Ha. Okay, jam 9 itu nanti yang juga mau ambil skripsi segala macam bisa nanti ya mendengarkan itu Bu Audrey mungkin yang mau nulis aku ganti nulis, aku ganti kuliah meneh aku Gis Gis ada mas Gis anak Agus Ardian ya. Apa? Sehat ya Pak Bu. Ngapa tak kok tak kok? Oh, Allah so sweet. <laughs> Alhamdulillah bahagia. Apa aja? Oh, so sweet guys ya Allah, oh, oh, sudah sampai tak kok. Lah iya. Mokong ya nyanyian, ditakoni. Takoni kok tambah apa takon-takon. Oh, itu sama nek wong saya. Kan iku sing mbok kangen ni. Kata-kata nah, saya nggak enak ngono itu tepat aku. <laughs> ya ampun. Mas Joni, Joni sadar. Dan? Yo i. Apa mau begini mari vaksin nggak popo ah? Aku lek mari ne nggak popo je. Sak durunge. Aku bayang no tahun dia Pak Sakti ku sebelas dua belas nak disuntik. Mas Guntur ya, Doni, so kau yang pasang. Masuk sih, enggak. Masuk Guntur yo, kerja ni. Salah, aku enggak sampai bunga bunga ungu lah. Paling macam. Tapi nanti ini duhur. Tak bunga bunga tapi menangis dalam mati. Lah ya, aku syukur. Paling blank ungu lagi. Boleh tu kan, kan? Hah? Tadi aku sedih ya bu ya. Ya paling maring ini ni ya. Eh bro, saya ngeliat ni ki layar eh pek awak ambek sirah. Rasaman sirah tak wes pek jalan layar eh. Ini macam buat zoom tak ya apa ini? Anja tak cerita cerita. Iki anyar kamera ni, dah ya. Kalau niar Budiana sa awak, iki si ratau sebab 